We're delighted to be here today with you all celebrating 50 years of connections that we've helped to foster across New Jersey. The New Jersey Council for the Humanities is a 501c3 nonprofit and the statewide partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we work across New Jersey to support and promote community-based collective exploration of our histories, values, cultures, and beliefs. For those of you who aren't familiar with NJCH, I encourage you to check out njhumanities.org and have a look at the programming we'll be doing all year to celebrate the public humanities in the Garden State. Before we get going, I just want to mention a few logistical details. Uh, if you wish to ask a question or make a comment during the program, please use Zoom's chat feature. Uh, to prevent background noise, we ask that you keep your microphone muted unless we ask you to unmute yourself. We encourage you to ask questions throughout, and we will pause during the event uh, to leave space for our, our discussants to answer those questions. So um, whenever they occur to you, feel free to, to pop them in the chat. Uh, and now, without further ado, I want to turn the Zoom screen over to our moderator for today, former NJCH board chair and president of the Fund for New Jersey, Kiki Jamieson. Uh, Kiki directed the Pace Center for Civic Engagement and taught in the politics departments at several area colleges and universities, including Princeton and Rutgers. She was a visiting scholar at the Institute for Advanced Study, and her academic work has focused on issues of discrimination and punishment related to gender identity and expression. She is the author of Real Choices, Fem Feminism, Freedom, and the Limits of Law, so as you can tell, she's just the right person to moderate today's event, which is called Working in Government Views from New Jersey Women. But she's going to begin today with a tribute to an NJCH board member whose career paved the way for the event that we're hosting today. Kiki. Thank you, Karen, and uh, welcome everyone. It's great to see so many friends of the humanities here today. We wanna to start off with a tribute to um, our former board member, Ruth Mandel, who died in April, 2020. Ruth was board of governor's professor of politics at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, and a senior scholar at the Center for the American Women in Politics. For 24 years, she directed the Eagleton Institute of Politics. Ruth was a fierce advocate for democracy and civic engagement and a champion of women's participation and leadership in all aspects of public life. Her influence created a legacy that lives on in a variety of venues, including here today. Ruth was born in Vienna, Austria in 1938, and she fled Nazi Germany as a very, very young child in 1939 on the SS St. Louis, which was a ship filled with Jewish people that was turned away from both Cuba and the United States. The overwhelming majority of the passengers on the St. Louis were returned to continental Europe where they eventually died in the Holocaust. But Ruth's family was accepted by England and therefore survived. Her family moved to the United States in 1947 and Ruth went on to earn both a bachelor's and a PhD in English and American literature, developing a thesis on Melville and a lifelong love of the humanities. Those early years produced in Ruth a deep conviction about the importance of democracy and particularly of including minority or marginalized voices in democracy. And that commitment in turn united professional pursuits for which she is particularly celebrated. Her role at the Center for American Women in Politics, her role on the board of the United States Holocaust Museum and her leadership of the Eagleton Institute. Ruth helped to found the Center for American Women in Politics in 1971 and she oversaw its decades of successes. And uh, here, Karen has found a wonderful clip from an interview with Ruth that talks about the growth of that center. Well, I, yeah, I'm, you know, very, very proud of it. And uh, so at, at first we survived and we grew and something very important happened in the mid nineties when I became director of Eagleton, which is, I had been director of COP for a long time and kept saying that I don't want, when the time comes for me to step aside as director of COP, 
I no one was telling me to do that, but it was it was time to be thinking about you know new ideas, new directions, and I did not want this to be seen as this was academia as Ruth Mandel's project. I wanted it to be an institution. I wanted it to be institutionalized, and um, so one of the things I'm very very most proud of is that. Um, we've managed to do that. It transitioned and the person who's the director now, Mary Hawksworth was for three years, but the person who's director now, Debbie Walsh, who's been here for not as long as I have, she came as a child, but she's been the director now for a long time. And she's done different things, new things, the world of technology and all the platforms and the websites. And she probably knows more about women in politics that is on the ground, who's there, what the patterns are, what, what's happening than anybody else. Um, and we have, at this point at the center, there are four of us, I'm still uh, affiliated as a senior scholar, there are four of us who are faculty members, three of us senior tenured and one junior person who I think has a great future already has done important work on women in politics. So there's an academic component. There are, you know, we have at this point programs, one called New Leadership, one called Ready to Run that have been franchised all over the country and there are colleges offering these programs and they've used our models and they've come and watched us do it. So it is, it, and you know, when there are articles about women in politics in the paper and so forth, COP is always cited uh, because we've got a very, very um, conscientiously wonderful database of uh, information, both historical and current about women in politics. So you're right. I mean, it is a success story. It's terrific. And it's did, I don't know what the moment was, but it did get to a point that it's um, uh, nobody makes fun of it anymore or thinks, you know, what are you doing or why is it worth it? Now, also the world outside really, collaborated with us on that because women have been moving forward in political life. And I just want, I want to say. So that's a, a sort of mid sentence ending, but she goes circles back to the more academic piece uh, after that. It's really wonderful to see Ruth um, and to hear her. Again, that arc that she describes both for women in politics and for the study of women in politics brings us here today um, with a humanities council that takes the history of women in politics seriously and with four women who have been trailblazers of the sort in whom Ruth herself would have been and was interested. Ruth was a dear friend to the Humanities Council. She loved literature, she cared deeply about her work and the people around her and she made the world a better place. We're lucky to have known her and to have worked with her. You will not be surprised to hear that one of Ruth's major contributions to the council focused on governance. She understood that institutional structures can enable or thwart participation and wise decision-making. And she brought her expertise to the table. The council's bylaws reflect her wisdom. But for me personally, my favorite memories of our shared time on the council were the very long drives to board meetings in North or South Jersey. Ruth was a wealth of knowledge and a fair amount of gossip about politics and policy in New Jersey and beyond. And since she believed that people should bring their whole selves to any enterprise, she also had a lot to say about a number of other subjects from literature and one of a kind accessories to philosophy and the lessons she learned about parenting. Through it all, she was committed to advancing opportunities for women as women to lead in public life. And today's program feels like a fitting way to honor Ruth and her legacy. I am delighted to introduce our speakers who will talk a little bit about their own experiences as women in politics. Deborah Karnavaka is Governor Murphy's Deputy Chief of Staff of Outreach. Deborah, wanna go ahead and wave. <laughs> she, uh, uh, she's also known as Dr. Cordovaca, who previously served as a statewide organizing expert at the New Jersey Education Association. And she's worked as a community organizer and lobbyist for nearly two decades in New Jersey. She graduated from Dartmouth College and holds a master's and PhD from UCLA in anthropological archeology span with a specialization in Latin American cultures prior to Spanish contact. 
She's also a great friend of the humanities and a longtime library trustee and chair. Sadaf Jaffer, Dr. Sadaf Jaffer is an assemblywoman representing New Jersey's 16th legislative district. Uh, thank you for waving. And she works to amplify the voices of LD16 residents, especially underrepresented communities. Sadaf is the first Asian American woman and the first Muslim American to be sworn into the New Jersey General Assembly. She's the former mayor of Montgomery Township and she currently teaches at Princeton University. She and her husband, Dan, a professor at Princeton, are raising their daughter in Montgomery Township. Carol Murphy, thank you, is a um, state assemblywoman, is in her third term representing the seventh legislative district and she holds the position of majority whip. She was elected in 2017 and is the first woman in over 20 years to represent the seventh district. She serves on several nonprofit boards, including the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. Thank you very much, Carol. The Alice Paul Institute in Paulsdale, the Girl Scouts Treepole Society, and the Girl Scouts for whom she's a delegate for Burlington County. In 2020, Carol started a nonprofit, Brittany Morgan's Kids, which is an organization assisting children in Burlington County. She and her husband, Michael Muller, live in the Rancocas section of Mount Laurel with their cat, Lexington. And Joe Schloeder, hi Joe, is Deputy Chief of Staff and District Director for Congressman Chris Smith, who is the Dean of New Jersey's Congressional Delegation. He represents the state's fourth congressional district. In her role, Joe oversees all district staff in three offices, and she develops and assists the congressman in implementing policy objectives, strategy, and operational plans. Before her work with the House of Representatives, she was director of Monmouth County Connection, the first satellite office of Monmouth County government. Joe earned her undergraduate degree in communications from William Patterson University and a master's in public administration from Rutgers University. She and her husband are the proud parents of a strong, confident woman who will surely make the world a better place. Jo is also an artist and musician, and she volunteers for a number of community-based organizations and is active in her church. Welcome to all of you. It's just wonderful to be with you today. Now, each of you has taken a different and interesting path to your current role in government, some elected, some working inside the system. And I'm hoping each of you can start by telling us a little bit about how you got interested in public service and what you hope to achieve, what kind of difference you wanted to make by getting involved. Um, can we start with Joe? You're muted. Yeah, somebody has to be the first one to make that mistake. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Um, sorry about that. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, it's, uh, to be in this group, it's really kind of a, kind of all inspiring for me. So thank you very much. Um, you know, you ask. Um, I believe the question is, you know, how did, how did we get involved in in this kind of uh, public service? I don't know if I speak for everybody else, but for me, there was never like a light bulb moment, like, wow, I wanna go into the public sector. Um, I think that you either have a, it's either in your DNA that you wanna serve people or it's not. Either you have that it comes naturally or it doesn't. And for me, I watched the people before me, you know, my grandfather served as a police commissioner and a mayor. I watched my parents serve in many capacities and I, I just thought everybody did that. Um, but one thing I can tell you is I truly believe that if you're going to be in the public sector, in public service, they call it service for a reason, you really have to have a servant's heart. You have to be compassionate. And I often joke that our jobs here in the congressman's office are just part detective, part social worker, um, part legal, legal, uh, part shoulder to cry on. Because by the time someone calls their member of Congress for help, they are typically at the end of their options and they're kind of desperate and we need every tool in the shed. And the biggest of those I believe is compassion. I'm very fortunate that I work for a very compassionate member, a compassionate ma'am, and I work with very caring and compassionate people. 
So for other people that want to get involved in public service, my suggestion would be whether it's in your community or the PTA or a local nonprofit or your church, the serving is serving your neighbors is always an opportunity and could lead to other opportunities in public service like government. Thanks very much, Joe. Uh, Carol, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, as we celebrate 50th anniversary of women in government, wow, um, only 50, you would think that it would be longer. So, you know, I, I, I can't even um, imagine uh, my life without being in office. And I'll tell you why. I started out in the legal field um, and because I wanted to be able to help residents um, I should say residents, just say uh, clients, be able to understand and, and maneuver when they're in car accidents and what they need to do and get them the help that they need and, and be that advocate for them. Um, I learned under the best attorneys there were on um, how to help out with that. But how I got started um, in government, in, in public services, it's kind of, it's, it's unique. Um, I started out because I wanted to be a coach for a a girls um, soccer field or a baseball or something on a, I wanted to coach for a girls team um, when I lived in Isham Township. And I was working for an attorney who knew the mayor of Isham at the time. And he goes, oh yeah, yeah, I'll get you in. I'll get you in a letter. I'll send a letter recommending you for, you know, to coach and all that. Next thing I know, I'm in um, one of their advisory boards and ended up being chair of their community relations and, I, and advisory boards on the township which put me in sports, don't, I mean, it did, put me in sports, but not as a coach. And then, you know, I got involved in my first campaign and it took off from there. But when I truly realized that I wanted to be in government, I realized back when I was a staffer for Senator Greenstein for a year and then with uh, Gabby Mascara for um, five or six years, and then I branched out on my own while still doing campaigns and things of that nature. I realized when I finally got elected that this is where I've always I've been working for for so many years um, in the fields that I, I chose, and that is to be a public service that is to be elected official. And one thing Joe said is so true, no matter what you do service is to your community of the heart, you don't have to be an elected official to be a public servant because there's so many ways that you can serve your community as a, as a public servant. But as a legislator, I find it rewarding to be able to um, make a difference, I'm hoping, in other people's lives through legislation, um, through so, uh, social work, my constituent relations. I um, got somebody freshly out of college who just graduated in May as my, um, my constituent director, and she has a social service um, or caseworker degree, as well as all of my staff, you know, out of college, they're ambitious, they're ready to go. And one thing that you said about whole self serve project that Ruth Mandel said, I couldn't agree more. As and as we start having these conversations and we start going through this, um, especially forward as women, we see that um, one of my pet peeves as a woman in government, and I know we'll get into this, is when someone says to me, "Oh, it's only business." because I too bring my whole self into my job. I bring who I am into it. So what you see in Trenton and what you see in my district office is what you see at home. Maybe a little less reserve at home, but uh, you basically see that. Um, and I'm not afraid to take on those tough fights when we need to. And as a woman in government, you really need to start figuring out as, as elected official, what are those fights you're willing to take on and not take on? And I think that's a hard thing because as a woman, we are compassionate. But so one of my favorite legislators had said to me a while ago is that never argue with anger, but argue out of passion. And that is something that as a, a woman in government, a person in government, um, I take true to heart that when you do argue just as attorneys do just as and it's great to have uh, someone here who is a uh, chief of staff um, for a member because all levels of government is is truly um, an accolade to calling for putting this together because there's just so many levels that you can learn from and I think it's great that we have the opportunity to speak with many folks um, so I will leave it there and be able to answer more questions to go along thanks that's great and um 
I'm thinking, Sada, if you're new to the assembly, but not new to politics and public life, are similar sorts of things influence you? I'm curious about how you're thinking about the difference that you want to make, particularly in your new role. Sure. Uh, so I think being interested in, in the world around me and trying to make it better, that is definitely something I got from my parents. I always say that we uh, always listen to NPR in the car. And uh, so I was always kind of hearing these conversations of what's happening in the news, what's going on, you know? Um, and I, uh, I went to Georgetown School of Foreign Service. I thought I wanted to go into diplomacy. And then I, uh, I interned at the State Department. I interned with the Marine Corps, uh, but I got very interested in my studies and I pursued a PhD uh, studying South Asian history and literature. Um, and then, you know, life brought me to the Princeton area. Uh, my husband uh, is a professor and, and I was teaching there as well. And I started thinking about local government and that, you know, a lot of times we, we are so focused because of the media that we consume is very focused on national and international issues. There isn't so much of, of a focus on the local. And um, I was actually uh, campaigning for someone who was running for Congress when I was asked to run for, for local office. And I decided to take up the challenge. I had participated in Ready to Run through the Center for American Women in Politics. I'd also participated in the Emerge program, which is for women from the Democratic Party who are interested in running for office. And so I decided to give it a try. I didn't win my first time. Uh, I, I was a write-in in 2016. And then in 2017, I ran on the ballot and I won my seat. And then I was uh, elected mayor and I served for two terms in that role. And then um, in LD16, uh, our state senator decided not to run for re-election and one of our assemblymen was running for that state Senate seat. And so I, again, was asked to run for assembly and I decided to give it a try. Um, I think that for me, uh, I, I think the message is just keep your, always be open to opportunities. And when you get involved, people see a passionate person or a hardworking person. And actually, they're always looking for candidates and always looking for people to, to run for office. And uh, you know, one of the most important pieces of information that I learned is that women win elections at the same rate as men. They just don't run as often. And that's why, you know, I decided if I want other women to run, <laughs> then I should also do it myself. I can't expect other women to do something uh, as you've heard from everyone so far and you're going to continue to hear. It's a service. So I can't expect other women to make those sacrifices if I don't do that myself. And so that's uh, what brought me to this point. And I'm very happy to see more and more women from diverse backgrounds getting involved in politics. It's it's very important. Uh, I definitely feel a sense of camaraderie with all the assembly women. Uh, the assembly men are great too, but I do just feel a connection to them and, I, and I'd like to see those ranks grow. Thanks. That's Thank you for sharing that experience. Uh, Deborah, your path is a little different and I'm hoping you can tell us both about how you got involved in public service, but also how you made that bridge from humanities and social science to, to public service. Thanks, Kiki and Karen. And um, Karen, it's such an honor to be here today and uh, so grateful for the opportunity. And I think it's so important to have these discussions of women in politics in the context of humanity. So I'm thrilled to be part of this with such esteemed um, panelists. Yeah, my route is circuitous. Um, and I think that's probably not unusual for many women. And it's my honest assessment that that's because uh, doors are not open for women is often by the male dominated network of politics as they are for women. So we have to find doors. We have to be, um, sometimes we, we don't get them opened early, but we know our interests, we pursue it and, and ultimately a door will open. Um, but mine comes through the ways I think many women do, which is I started organizing and advocating in my community for my children. Uh, we had a middle school that was built for 600, housing 1400 when my child was, my oldest one was in elementary school. And I knew that for me to stay in this community, we needed a new middle school by the time he got there or I wasn't gonna send him there. And I became involved at that level. 
Uh, later on, I began to fight for school funding under the previous administration when school funding was cut in the third quarter of you know, promised budget commitments to our schools, and I saw what was happening. And it was really that that opened doors for me, although my interest in po public policy stems from you know, way back my high school years. I was a high school and college debater, later a coach, so policy was always part of what I did. I was raised in a Jewish school where we were embedded with tikkun olam, you have to find a way to make the world a better place. So service was very much part of my upbringing, my interest in policy was, um, but I did not know, nor were, were I, was I afforded opportunities of saying, I see your interest, here's a pathway, here's a door open for you. So I very much through my own passionate commitments found ways and, and perhaps you know, along the way, there were critical people who saw in me something and lifted me up or encouraged me, uh, mostly women, not all. There were some men along the way. Um, but I also just kept pushing at doors until I, you know, my persistence helped, right? And certainly becoming part of a library board was part of that. And the reason I became part of the library board is I was nudging my mayor about things I wish the library was doing. And he finally said to me, I've got an empty spot. I'm just going to put you there and you can go see if you can get those things done. So it was really through my my own personal commitments and activism that I landed certain spots along the way and then I was lifted up by people who took um, notice and, and then I took advantage of those opportunities. So um, my academic career, which maybe we'll talk more about later, was certainly something that helped me, but it was through not pursuing my academic career at the moment in time that I had young children and advocating for them that really I can tell you I ended up here today. Thanks very much. I'm seeing definitely a, a number of themes, right, that, that are already emerging, including that all of you both recognized barriers, but on some level refused to see them as barriers and found your way up and over and around. Um, I am curious if, if you see in, in your time in public life, if you see a change in those barriers that exist, are they, are more of them falling away for the folks who are are following the trails that you're blazing um, or are new barriers popping up? In other words, are, is there progress that is being made? And I, I mean, that question is for anybody who wants to go first. I'll go first, why not? Um, you know what, we, we have seen um, a lot of progress, um, but one thing that I think we as women need to do a better job at um, is, more of boosting up other women. Um, I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in making sure that we're able to continue making a name for ourselves and a debt and letting people know, hey, we're here as a woman, but not only that, but as a professional in the field that we're doing or as, you know, whatever our job is, we're, we're, we're so focused on that that sometimes we forget that maybe someone who's just entering the field, um, whether it's government, local, county, state, federal, or in any type of job, we tend to forget, okay, they may be just a little hesitant. So maybe instead of trying to just continue on with what we're doing, we need to embrace them. I think it's important, um, and, and I'm gonna give a plug for um, Alice Paul for a moment. Um, one of the greatest things about Alice Paul is they have GLC girls, is, um, and they are government leaders uh, group of girls. Who are, who are just such inspiring, um, they really are. And as you start seeing the different fields, these young girls want to go in and they're being nurtured. And as I do some of the uh, mentoring days that they have and talking to them, they are so well equipped to take charge and take lead um, and, and be that person with, with, which, with which people really need to see that um, the women are coming a long way, that we as legislators, including myself, instead of just creating a path for people to walk through, we want them to go past us. We want them to run past us so they can, they can make waves even longer um, and bigger and wider um, instead of just trying to keep them below with what we're doing. And I think as women, we sometimes forget that and we need to make sure that we constantly encourage women to move forward. And my biggest example is that we as women, even today, we'll have a small piece of the pie. We'll have a quarter slice of that pie. 
And we as women, we have 37 women in the legislature, give or take of one or two here. Um, we're all vying for that small piece of pie. We need to figure out how to get more of that pie so we're not vying for that one quarter. Um, and I think that's, that's something that we have yet to achieve to be able to get bigger. Um, today is, um, you know, today the governor signed in, I think it was like three years ago, and Deborah probably be able to know more about the facts on this one. We signed in the Al, uh, Diane Allen equity pay bill, which unfortunately just in 2019 or 2018, it was signed into law uh, providing pay equity to women. Um, there's just so much more we have to do and we can't forget and we can't stop learning. So I think we just need to do a little bit better in trying to make sure our women who are entering the field and want to aspire to be something bigger that we're there to lift them up. And I think we just need to do a little bit better job on that one. Thanks, Carol. It's such an important reminder that New Jersey, the home of Alice Paul, right? One of the, the trailblazers uh, for women's rights and freedom is also, and, and seen as a progressive state that embraces equity, um, also is, is not always at the forefront of women in public life, right? We have, we, we do much worse than, than other states and, um, and those continue to be those challenges. Uh, Joe, from your perspective, are you seeing a are you seeing a change um, in, in women's participation? I'm thinking both from your county experience and your, your work at the federal level. Um, so I'm not a, a, the best one to ask this because my first public sector job when I was in my 20s was for the Girl Scouts. As most people know, is a very empowering organization for women. So early on, I did not experience a lot of the same ob obstacles that other people have. Since then, of course, we have all run into the good old boys club from time to time. Um, but no disrespect to the men in the room. We're Jersey girls, we're kind of tough. We're not easily discouraged. <laughs> um, I think from my point of view, what I see most, the barriers that I see most in, are often self-imposed. We tell ourselves as women, all kinds of self-destructive things like I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I don't have enough education, uh, nobody will consider me a leader, oh, this is gonna be bad for, um, it's gonna be tough for my children or my relationships or other things like that. For the most part, a lot of these things either don't matter or they don't come to pass. So for women who want to go in public service, I agree with Assemblywoman Murphy that the first thing you need to get is a good, strong mentor, uh, a woman who will kick you in the butt when you talk to yourself like that and put you on the right path. Um, and similarly, if you're working in an organization um, or for someone who doesn't value you, who doesn't value what you bring to the table, find somebody who's going to appreciate you. So words to live by. Um, Zada for Deborah, any thoughts on this question? I'll say certainly without a doubt, there has been progress made. If you look at the role that the women here today on the panel are filling, there's no doubt there's progress. Uh, when my mother divorced in the early 70s, she couldn't get a credit card in her own name. It's very hard to run for office if you can't charge a flyer or a campaign sign, right? So I think without a doubt, there's been progress. And I think it's important we recognize that and celebrate it. Um, there are so many more women in roles in politics than there have been a generation ago. There is much more to do, but I would say that a foundational problem still remains, which is that politics is still structured in the patriarchal model in which it was created, which was white male dominated. And that structure is an exclusive structure which doesn't let loose of its power easily to allow more people in, more diversity in, and different ways of operating in. And I would propose as a broad generalization that certainly has exceptions, that when you put women together to lead in a room, there is a different kind of collaboration um, that can happen than when you put men in a room to collaborate. Again, a very broad generalization, there are absolutely exceptions to that. Um, but that's what I mean when I talk about a patriarchal model of politics within which we're still functioning. And to see that change, to see 
the balance of power shift to allow for more inclusivity, more diversity and equity of those diverse voices at decision making tables, that structure has to give more. And that's very hard because political structures are built in that model to preserve power, to hold power, not to share power. Right. I come from the Saul Alinsky world where I believe power is amplified when power is shared. That is not a universal uh, sentiment around power. So I think that women have much accomplished much. We have much more to accomplish. We have much more to contribute, not just by being in the seats, but by setting the table. Right. We often talk about how you have to have a seat at the table. I don't I don't want to just have women have a seat at the men's table. I want the men to come to the tables that we set where we decide the menu. We decide what's being served and we decide the service. And I would propose that that would prioritize different things um, sometimes and lead to different results. And so I'm looking for more of that in the next level of progress as women in politics pursue. So let's pick up on that, if you don't mind, Sonneth, and we'll, we'll just to move the conversation forward. One of the one of the things we've asked you to think about in advance of this conversation is how the, um, the practices and values of the humanities affect your work, right? Thinking about history and ethics and culture. Uh, I'm really struck, Deborah, by what you're saying and thinking about how Audre Lorde reminded us that you can't use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house, right? If you want a different structure, a different setting, then you have to do different things, right? Try different strategies and find different partners, um, as Joe mentioned, right, to help you along the way. So is, is, there a, is there a role for the humanities in all of this? Clearly a leading question. Or what is the role for the humanities in all of this? And does that provide a way that, that is helpful to you as public leaders to think about bringing in uh, both changing changing the worlds in which you work, but also creating and and uh, and welcoming in more opportunities for other women to join you. I, you know, I, I'll, I'll start by saying there's absolutely a, a phenomenal opportunity for um, humanities to be part of government and, and women. I've learned so much, not only being on the board, but in prior to being on the board, um, as a legislator, learning what different communities represent. I come from a community relations background. And let me tell you, when, when we talk about communities, um, we, we talk about difference. We talk about what each community brings in, no matter how same they are, no matter what town they live in, each neighborhood, each community is different. But as we, as we start learning about history and culture, and we start learning about um, what people did before us, that brings a whole different human side of things, things that we need to learn, things that, you know, the arts, the things that it was, um, it, it, brings, it brings to not only your community, but to yourselves and being able to advocate and how you treat your, your job as a legislator or someone in government is based upon that. I have had the great opportunity of taking what I've learned um, in different avenues and adding it to pieces of legislation that would hopefully benefit the Council of Humanities in so many ways, such as tourism um, and, and bringing more of that to New Jersey, um, identifying, recognizing those folks, recognizing um, I have a bill up in, um, I believe it's in the law and public safety on Thursday, um, which is a weird place for this one, but yeah, um, because we're not having too many more committee meetings until we meet on the 28th. But that would bring in a lot of the Irish roots for people since it's St. Patty's Week. It's being able to identify that, um, being able to bring more of that. And I think as we start talking about those different cultures that we wanna identify, we want to bring out, we want to say, hey, we're all, I like to think of us as a mosaic, not as a melting pot because as a mosaic, we're bringing so many different people and their heritage and their culture together that we're able to start learning about people and we're able to start studying the history of many other, other ways of life and not just stay in focus on one area. And as we start doing that, um, we're, we're able to start you know, opening our view on things to start learning more. And- That's really- It's basically- Oops, that, now you're muted. I just was gonna say, that's a really helpful framing in it. And it makes me think, Sada, so you have the 
the wonderful, um, you know, recognition, but also maybe a little bit of a challenge of being a first, right? You're the first this and the first that, and um, and also new in your assembly term is are the ways that Carol's talking about how humanities informed work resonating with you? Uh, absolutely, I think that what the humanities has prov provided me is creativity. Uh, one of my complaints about government sometimes is that there's not a lot of creativity or people think, well, this is the way that it's done. And I, I think being someone from a humanities background, the first question is why? <laughs> why? Why does it have to be this way? And I think I frustrate my chief of staff sometimes. So she's like, this is just how it is. <laughs> like, why, why? Um, so I think having that creativity definitely helped, uh, especially you know, serving as mayor during the pandemic. And the first thing I did was start reading up on what happened in the last flu pandemic uh, in, you know, around 1918. And I started publishing, uh, printing out these big guidebooks on leadership in a pandemic and reading through them and, you know, setting up what are the issues that we're going to be dealing with that are very uh, troubling, food insecurity, uh, how is food going to be getting to us and, and all of that sort of thing. And I, you know, would hand it out to the staff, like, we're going to be reading this now and, and working through it. But I think that has given me such a gift, uh, be, having that privilege of an education in the humanities to approach things from a creative uh, perspective, to be able to sift through a lot of different perspectives and try to glean uh, solutions or glean uh, my outcomes from all those different things. And I think a connection to the human. Uh, when I used to do uh, video messages to the community during COVID, I usually used to end with a poem because I felt like what people really needed in this very terrifying time was a sense of connection and a, a sense of the human and the fact that, you know, tragedies and, and horrible situations like the pandemic have, humanity has faced them uh, many times and has often produced art to make sense of it. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we did, uh, again, was we, we created a website called Montgomery Together, and we would share people's artwork and, you know, student performances and things like that. So I think um, I'm very, I'm very grateful that I've had that opportunity for that sort of an education in the humanities and, and just for what the humanities offers us. And uh, I know that a lot of creatives have have been posting these things like, oh, you didn't think the arts were worthwhile? What did you do the whole pandemic? You watched movies, you listened to music, you know, you played video games or whatever that were designed by graphic artists and you know, musicians and filmmakers. So I, I think we realize how essential the arts and humanities really are. And uh, it's something that I'm certainly dedicated to and making sure that students in New Jersey have, an, have access to an education in the arts and humanities because, um, I think, you know, being Asian American, uh, you know, seeing how a lot of other countries have approached education and really focusing only on the technical uh, and the scientific, there's something missing. You, you need a well-rounded, you need a well-rounded education to progress as a society. And certainly civic education is something that we all know people need. We want people to feel like their political system uh, you know, represents them, that we want people to understand how valuable democracy is and that we should all be thankful because people have fought and died for the system that we live in and many people throughout the world wish that they could have a representative government like we do. Um, so I, I'm glad that I can be a person who, you know, is a scholar of history and literature, is in government and can kind of bring the strengths and insights and experiences I have to both places. So similarly, when I'm talking to my mm -hmm. students, you know, I, I I'm teaching a course on Asian American studies and teaching about South Asian, um, South Asian American literature and film. And I'll talk to them like, oh, well, we had a kind of community meeting when I was mayor. And these were some of the things that came up. These are some of the anxieties that people that, you know, some 
white Americans have about Asian Americans, you know, they're taking our jobs or, you know, why is it that they have more economic prosperity? What do we think about that? Why is that, you know, at what point will Asian Americans be considered American without that sense of foreignness? So there's, there's things that I can bring back and forth. And um, I'm, really, I'm very glad that I have that opportunity. It, it's really helpful. I'm struck at the, the threads you're connecting, right? Across the policy issues and the disciplines of history and ethics and, and bringing them, learning from the past and, and bringing those things together. I noticed Joe leaning forward too, making a connection. As you were talking, Joe, how do you think about these issues? Well, I, I'm, I'm like chomping at the bit. <laughs> like, yes, I agree. I agree. I agree with that. I agree with that. But first of all, you know, the humanities in our work. I know that this sounds self-evident, but sadly, it's not. There is no place where ethics and values are more important than in public service. And I'll just, you know, sadly, it's not always obvious. We can leave that right there. But I mean, history. Everybody has heard the quote from Winston Churchill that if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. And whether you're on the state level or the federal level or any level of, of community or government, knowing what's happened in the past is invaluable so that we don't make the, stake, the mistakes of those people who have, who have come before us. And I, I just have to put in one other plug for the humanities and because I directly supervise people, I see this a lot in that there is perhaps no better skill, I think, than you can have if you're working in the public sector, not no better skill. It's one of the most important tools in your toolbox, and that is the, the ability to write. Um, with texting and emailing and tweets and posts, um, our, our children, our teens, and sometimes our 20s now even, I think some have lost the ability to really express themselves in the written word. And if we can do nothing else, I think it's important that we advocate for our children to read literature and be able to write, maybe not like the great masters, but to be able to affect change in writing. Because I think as people gravitate, gravitate toward tech, um, that might be a lost art or humanity, whatever the right term is. I think you're preaching to a room of people who <laughs> agree with you on that one. And, um, you know, it raises the question about as, as we, we think about women in public life and, and just your roles as, as public leaders, how can the humanities be of service to public service in New Jersey? What are the most pressing opportunities for humanities um, in, in New Jersey's communities in the next few years. Deborah? I suppose I would offer two, two avenues to answer that. I mean, the first is that, and it's been alluded to, humanities is such an integral part of a strong background in education to be within public service for so many reasons. Um, for me, within anthropology, the understanding of culture, right? And and here, you know, yes, do can I say that I understand things about other cultures from other nations? Yes, but I can also parse and understand political culture uh, because it teaches us to look at structures of society. It teaches us to look at power relationships and dynamics. And I think it's also very important to know where you've come from to understand where you're going. It doesn't have to be on a straight trajectory of co continuity but we are a democracy embedded deeply within the ancient history of Greek democracy, right? So I think you, you do need to know some of these pieces along the way and have tools to put into context and to maintain some perspective of the systems within which one operates. Um, and and I, for me, that's an essential piece of being a change maker. If I lack that perspective, then I am simply part of it. Um, which I am to some extent, but I'm also committed to bringing change. So that background, that education, I think is so critical to people within uh, the political sphere, whether it's, it's through elected office or other avenues of service. And then I think it's equally as important as Assemblywoman Joffre is so well articulated to be defenders of teaching humanities, of supporting humanities. Um, 
my oldest is, is now a musician and would be lost if not for the fact that schools encouraged both it through their education, but also supported his time away from school to do that work. Um, and along with that, yes, I completely agree, Joe, that his ability to write, right, is those basic skills you really need and they serve really well. And so as, as, as we talk so much about the importance of STEM education, which I, I am supportive of, it cannot be at a loss of the humanities. It has to be part of, it has to be a complement to, right? And this is where I think sometimes a, a woman's way of doing it is more likely to see that it's not su supplanting, it's supplementing, that we have more room to, to grow a pie and give more space to integral pieces, but not saying you should be doing this instead of that. Um, so I think it's extremely important to have our voices in there. And as so many women still remain primary caretakers of our children, we're more likely to connect to the ways in which my daughter will always make it to school on a day she's got musical theater, right? Like we, we recognize that, we see that as those primary caretakers, not to say that some men don't, but the majority of primary caretakers still remain to be women. We see those things and therefore we're more likely to be voices for those things in decision-making rooms um, and in policy-making rooms. So both in terms of what we do, but then also what we advocate for. I think humanities has to remain at the center and it has to be uh, centered in a way that we add to it, we build around it, but we never uh, supplant it. We just, we supplement. In, in our remaining minutes, I'm going to ask Carol, Joe, and Sadaf the same question. Right? What should be the priority for the humanities in our communities here in New Jersey? I'll, I'll speak to this a little bit. I think that um, programs like this uh, and, you know, being someone who is in an institute of higher education, I think that you know, the research that happens there is really important, but we also need to have parts of it that are accessible to the general public or create materials that could be used in a K through 12 classroom uh, through our research. So I think public engagement is so important. Like let's not allow these things to become totally bifurcated. We need people who are professionals in, in the humanities and the arts to think about how to democratize, democratize access to those things. So it's not just students at elite institutions who are able to engage in them um, and to bring those insights in ways that are digestible and you know, could fit into a curriculum or things of that nature. Um, you know, I'm thinking, for example, of the fact that now we are gonna have Asian American studies as a part of our K through 12 curriculum in New Jersey. And so I think it would be great if you know, professor, professors of Asian studies and Asian American studies could help create some of those materials that, that teachers will be using. Uh, so I think I just want more people to try to bridge these, these worlds. Thank you. Joe, what would be your recommendation? And you're muted. Sorry, did it again. Um, listen, I just went back and got my master's a couple of years ago. So um, I was able to enter higher education as a um, seasoned adult. How's that? Nice way to put it. Um, and I think one of the things that I took away from that is that I saw that oftentimes our society um, doesn't teach students, our children, to think, to think. They tell them what to think. Whereas the study of the humanities doesn't tell children how to think. It doesn't tell us how to think. It teaches them how to think for themselves. And critical thinking and the ability to analyze a situation, sometimes creatively, as Deborah said, um, these are all the end results of a study of humanities. And I think that they are uh, just integral in in public service, and it's something humanities can do for public service. Thank you. Absolutely agree. Carol, your recommendations? My recommendation, uh, so I, I couldn't agree more with everybody what they said, but um, I will just give you an analogy. Last week and the week before, I did Read Across America um, with kids in first and second grade. And 
first of all, it was such a, it's, it's such a great experience, but what amazes me more with them. And I think this like sums up a lot of what everybody's talking about is when it comes to civics and understanding, um, while we were reading the book, it's associating that book with the things that are going on. But one thing that they were, they didn't understand was what is the levels of government? What is it that we do? How, how does it play a role in what they're doing in school? Um, and what we do as leaders of their community. And I think um, taking that and, and doing what you had said about the writing and the reading, and it's all about sharing. It's all about sharing what one person's perspective is to another. And as I close this out, I have to tell you a few weeks ago, I sat on a panel um, for diversity, inclusion and equity or equity inclusion the DEIs, and hopefully we can get rid of those symbols and that label. And this becomes a way of life where diversity, and I learned this from a woman who was sitting on the panel with me real quick from um, in Alabama, the uh, Black Lobbyist um, Caucus that she runs in Alabama. And she's so right when she said this, diversity is easy to accomplish because we can get many people of diverse backgrounds it's how do we how do we input that into our world? How do we include them? How what what is the inclusion part of that? That's the hardest part, and the equality is the hardest part. And as we one thing humanities can do is bring that inclusion together with us. It can also allow for equal, and equal whether it's equal say in something, equal around the table, equal participation. Um, all of that allows us to be in that, in that qualifier for humanities. And you know, I couldn't be prouder to sit here and tell you as a board member, but not only that, but as someone who has learned a lot from not only boards, but committees and what we need to do to bring more of that awareness to our world. Um, I could tell you I'm all for it. And as we start bringing more of our diversity to the forefront, and as a woman who just got on around the table on a leadership table, let me tell you, um, you sit there and, and, you know, being part of this, even though it's only been a few weeks as part of, you know, the leadership table with a speaker who has done a great job at bringing more diversity to the assembly with women, it's not good enough just being a woman in leadership. We have to now, I got my opportunity, now it's what do we do with it? What do I do with it? And bringing that to the forefront, I think this all encompasses a uh, better way to make way for not only humanities, but for everybody else. Thank you. I am so disappointed that we don't have an extra hour and that we're not all together in the same place. Uh, because it's really been a privilege to listen to you and, and think of, learn from you and to reflect on, on what you're saying about women in politics and public life, the themes of, of inclusion and compassion and broad participation, but also transformation, right? Not being satisfied with how things are and recognizing the power uh, that you all have and the power that other women and allies have to change the systems and to infuse those humanistic values. It's, it's really inspiring and energizing. And I'm very, very grateful to all of you on the panel for participating. And thank you to Karin for allowing me to be part of this. Um, let me turn it back to Karin. Thank you so much, Kiki, Assemblywoman Murphy, Assemblywoman Joffer, uh, Deborah, Joe, I, I'm so grateful to all of you for being here today. I feel um, inspired and energized by uh, everything that you've said, and, and it feels like it, you know, it leaves something for me to live up to and for us to live up to. Uh, so I, I'm grateful to all of you. Um, I want to remind everybody, um, if you haven't seen NJCH's emails about it, um, we're doing an event a month as part of our 50th anniversary celebration, and we're going to continue with the theme of democracy next month. Uh, on April 5th, we will be launching our statewide uh, Smithsonian exhibit Voices and Votes that will be traveling to six community colleges in the state. Uh, that launch party is going to take place at Rowan College, Burlington County. Um, it will be a reception 5 p.m. April 5th. It's going to be our first in-person event since March of 2020. So I'm um, really excited. Uh, I'm 
delighted to see people in person again. I hope all of you will think about coming out. I'm going to put the link in the ch chat to register. Um, so there'll be food, there'll be a great exhibit, more conversation about representation and democracy. Uh, so I hope to see you there. And then just uh, take good care, uh, keep an eye on our website, and thank you to all of you for being with us today.